and uh, especially we're so happy to have Terry come uh, join us for our first on my bar. So it's going to be a really great night. Uh, before we start, I would like to acknowledge that Guelph is situated on the ancestral homeland of the Anishinaabe peoples, specifically the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Great First Nation. Uh, through the Between the Lakes Purchase Number 33 of 1793, the Mississauga Book of Credit ceded to the British Crown over 3 million acres of land between Lakes Huron, Ontario, and Erie. And today, Guelph is home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. And Guelph Museums continues to build our knowledge and relationship about the land and First Nations people. And this commitment informs all that we do at Guelph Museums. <coughs> and uh, now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Paul Terry. Um, Terry is a leading scholar of Canada's uh, military role in the Second World War, and he's an influential advocate for military history in both military and civilian post-secondary education. His books on battle exhaustion on the 5th Canadian Infantry Brigade, and his two volumes on the Canadians in Normandy and Northwest Europe, Field of Fire and Cinderella Army, which are both the same right there, um, have led to reinterpretation of Canadian soldiers' effectiveness in 1944 and 1945. Uh, he was also the on-screen historian for the television series No Price Too High, and he's a regular contributor to Legion Magazine. And I think I'll leave it at that and welcome Terry up here, and thank you so much for coming tonight, Terry. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. So um, we're kind of doing some social culture rather than military history tonight, because that it's in a military context. And I'm very pleased to see you all here. Um, this is my first post-COVID public lecture outside of the confines of Wilfrid Laurier University. And uh, I've come here to Guelph uh, a number of times in the past. Um, I want to begin by saying that um, the subject of tonight's talk isn't entirely abstract to me. My dad was born in Dublin in 1908 and lived through all of the events that we'll be describing on the Irish side of the story uh, before emigrating to Canada in 1924 uh, to join his brother, my uncle, who had actually reached Canada slightly before the opening of the First World War, and who observed the events we're talking about tonight in Montreal and Ireland uh, from a vantage point uh, working in the city Percy, uh, my uncle, then joined the Canadian Army and served overseas, though not with the Irish Canadian Rangers. Uh, he joined in 1915 before active recruiting was underway for the Irish Canadian Rangers. So to some degree, this has been a, an exploration, I guess, of the memory of my dad. My brother David is here, and he and I both have stories, sometimes different stories about the same event. I don't know if you have that experience with your uh, oral history interpretation of uh, your fathers and such. Um, let me know the next step. Um, <clears throat> I began writing this book, Montreal War, 1914-18, which is a combination of social and military history and ultimate chapters, um, because I taught a class, uh, a number of classes, but the one I'm thinking of in particular, um, we got involved in research papers which were based upon an attempt to do the social history of the war in the context of Guelph and uh, Toronto and other areas, and I found the students deeply engaged by the idea of using the personnel records uh, the attestation papers and the newspapers. And I, I think I can say this in all honesty. I have been a teacher for since 1959, a very long time ago, of either high school or university. And I've always felt deeply involved with my students. And I've always felt I was learning from my students as well as teaching them, indeed, sometimes on the other foot. And in that class, we began to uh, develop a bunch of ideas. Uh, and the ideas were developed from the students, from me, but above all from a book written by a British historian, Adrian Gregory, called
called the last great war, uh, British society and the First World War. And uh, Gregory's book runs through as a kind of core of my book on Montreal and War, using his questions and using his insights to help illuminate what it is that was taking place in the city. Um, but one thing I wanted to pull from Gregory immediately is this quotation, which begins his book and begins mine. Hindsight has been the curse of writing about the war. We know how things turned out and can therefore attempt to explain why they turned out as they did. We must remember that hindsight is unavailable to those of us who are living through the experience and it cannot inform decisions. The First World War was not fought, and then Terry has added, or experienced in retrospect, and we must stop refighting and rewriting it that way. In other words, what we want to do, I think, what we ought to do as historians, is study experience as it unfolds, as it's understood by the people who are experiencing the events. And this will help us to understand, I think, that what history really teaches is the importance of accident, of chance, the role of uncertainty, the lack of determination in almost anything that we take underway. And we find ourselves in a world in which it's necessary to examine each of the issues that we want to try and understand in fairly considerable detail, or we're just glossing over and using other people's easy opinion rather than undertaking what is legitimate and necessary research. Gregory does this magnificently for England, and I've had a try at Montreal. I must say that I narrowed it down to Montreal not because it's the city of my birth and raising, and not because I've written about Montreal previously, but because two of my many outstanding students in that era, uh, Brendan O'Driscoll and Jeff uh, Hewen, uh, were working on Montreal-related topics, and they got me re-involved in the history of the city, which I've actually left behind a long time ago. So it was, again, a tribute to them uh, uh, that uh, I was able to uh, begin to undertake this task. Uh, Jeff, who now works for Archives Canada, uh, did his PhD thesis on Henri Bourassa, and that's published a version of the book, uh, a version of the thesis as a book. Uh, he uh, is unhappy with my interpretation of Bourassa, just as I'm unhappy with his, but both of us learned a great deal in the process of debating how to fix this particular individual in time. So um, this is the uh, Alexander, sorry, Montreal War, 1418. It says, Terry Kopp with Alexander O'Hara. I was hoping Alec would be here tonight because while he wasn't a co-author, uh, he's not a Canadian historian and not a specialist in the, in the way that I think it's fair to say I am, um, he's simply the person who made it all work compiling the databases that I needed in order to make relatively clear statements, establishing a website in which we put up much of this material in a first draft form, and steadying me in all aspects of the research, uh, which was, was a tremendous in scope. Uh, Alec deserves uh, to be listed on the title page, but there were a whole bunch of other students who were involved at the Laurier Center for military strategic resarmament studies at various times, working as research assistants, including the young man who uh, did the work on the Irish Canadian Rangers uh, in terms of each one of the attestation and personnel record papers that are available. So um, those are, I guess, the commercial announcements that precede the talk itself. Uh, and uh, I'll turn immediately to uh, what we're here to talk about. <clears throat> Okay. On St. Patrick's Day, 1914, which is a Sunday, the St. Patrick's Day Parade, and there will be such St. Patrick's Day Parade in North America, dating all the way back to the 1920s, sorry, 1820s, 
was held in Montreal under Wright Sunshine. In typical Montreal fashion, three days later, it snowed, leaving five inches all over the city. But it didn't dampen enthusiasm because the St. Patrick's banquet was to be held at Montreal's Windsor Hotel, the place where one would hold splendoriferous banquets. And this was marked particularly by the presence at the banquet of one of the most famous Irishmen of the time, uh, the brother of John Redmond, Sir William, <coughs> William Redmond. Now, I want to stop on a number of occasions and talk about who these people were for a few moments to get you situated if you're not involved in Irish history in any way. William Redmond, as everyone called him, uh, was um, a member of parliament in the House of Commons in the United Kingdom for an Irish constituency. There were 77 Irish MPs in the British House of Commons. And uh, his brother John was not only another MP from Ireland in the British House of Commons, but was the leader of what was called the Irish Parliamentary Party, which was the dominant force in Irish politics and becoming increasingly a powerful and influential force in British politics because the Liberal government of Henry Asquith was dependent upon the Irish Parliamentary Party to secure a majority. And particularly of importance was the need to have the Irish Parliamentary Party on side in order to overcome the opposition of the House of Lords to the taxes in the budget that Asquith was bringing forward. So the tie between the Asquith Liberals and uh, John Redmond and the Parliamentary Party was um, a major importance. Now, what the Irish Parliamentary Party got in return for its loyal support for what some people call the Lord George budget and for the ability to bypass the House of Lords, which could no longer block legislation from the House of Commons, what the Irish Party got in return was the promise of home rule in Ireland. Now, the Irish had been fighting the Irish Parliamentary Party, beginning with Parnell, of course. Thomas Parnell, the great leader of Ireland in the 19th century. He and William Gladstone had constructed the first and second Home Rule Bills. But those Home Rule Bills were blocked by the British House of Lords, which prevented Ireland from acquiring not what we would call dominion status, as we understand it in Canada, and as they understood it in Ireland, but perhaps the equivalent of province, provincial status in Canada, with the British government being the equivalent of the Canadian government. In other words, Home Rule, either in the 1860s or in 1912-14, did not involve independence. The British would still control foreign policy. They would still have a veto over customs and excise. And they would, in fact, have a supervisory role but internally, if the Home Rule Bill was passed, then there would be a form of autonomy from Ireland that the more radical members of the Irish, Irish Parliamentary Party believed would allow independence, full independence for Ireland, to be obtained gradually and carefully. So these are the two famous Irishmen, not only in Ireland, but in Montreal. And at every St. Patrick's Day ceremony in the 20th century, the early 20th century, the key message of the night would be a message from John Redmond to the Montreal Irish in order to keep them on side. Uh, Willie is um, a very different character. He is a Parnellite to his core, which means he went to jail uh, during the late uh, part of the 1880s. Um, he was already uh, 53 years old when this picture was taken. And Willie um, is so determined to carry forward. I'm just not going fast enough. Yet. Okay. And he actually joins the Irish army serving in Europe at the age of 55 and fights for Ireland and for Britain and against the tyranny of Germany, uh, and is killed at the Battle of Nicene Ridge. And is, at the time, a deeply, profoundly uh, 
known and, and considered person. Um, so having Willie Redman actually come up, and he was true in the States, come up from New York for the St. Patrick's Day Bank it was a big deal at the time. Now, uh, what I want to do next is to simply say that uh, in, in Montreal, as in Dublin, or in that matter in Belfast, um, everyone is waiting in 1914 for the culmination of what is called the Third Home Rule Bill, the Bill of 1912-1914, which will give Ireland that degree of quasi-independence that I described. It's been a long process. The bill was passed in 1912 and won't be implemented until 1914 because, of course, of the problem of Ulster, which I shall come to in a moment. But back to Montreal. The Montreal Irish, who are so delighted to have Willie Redmond there, and so delighted that St. Patrick's Day is a period of celebration, have, like the rest of Montreal, come through one of the worst winters of the 20th century, including those which will take place during the Depression. The recession of 1913-14 has affected Montreal with particular misery, because what has really happened is a collapse of railway construction. And railway construction and railway companies concentrated on Montreal have really just closed in, and the city is full of young men uh, without jobs, uh, seeking any kind of refuge that they can find in a, um, a winter of exceptional severity. The Murle Refuge, a brand new open facility which can hold 1,200 men a night, is in fact full all the time in other uh, nearby places. And uh, so long as they agree to move by 6 a.m., they're allowed to come back uh, after uh, the winter day is over that night. I could give you along, and I do in the book, a number of illustrations of how serious this was. But the Irish population has something to celebrate in, the, in, in March. And that, of course, is from the rule. It is roughly 80,000 people in Montreal who claim Irish descent. Most of them Roman Catholics, about 10% of those Irish Protestants. And uh, they're well aware that the population of Irish ancestry is declining as a percentage in the city, because of course there has been no massive new Irish immigration uh, since the 19th century. We're talking about a, a Canadian Irish population uh, that is now in many cases in third generation but has not lost their sense of being Irish. So um, that's a problem for them. And they're also well aware that the uh, assimilation uh, to the English-speaking community, what I call the Anglo-Celtic majority, uh, is underway uh, all over the place. That the traditional Irish area of the city, Griffintown, Point St. Charles, the ward of St. Anne's, is rapidly losing its Irish majority. It actually already has by 1911, and the Irish are spreading it to the city in a fairly normalized way. Um, maybe the best illustration of this to say is the most powerful businessman in the city, far and away the leader of the Montreal business community and therefore the Canadian business community in the pre-war period, is Thomas Shaughnessy, not yet Lord Shaughnessy the president of the Canadian Pacific Railway, and a phenomenal member of the board of all the important banks and financial institutions. Shaughnessy is a Roman Catholic, originally from Milwaukee, but he has come to Canada as a young man, risen through the ranks of the CPR, and has, as I suggest, a very dominant position. He will become Lord Shaughnessy the following year, and Shaughnessy and his family um, including his sons, who we'll talk about a little bit later, are perhaps the most prominent Irish. But we could go on, and I will for a moment. The Minister of Justice in the Borden government, C.J. Charles J. Dorothy, is another Irish Catholic, a member of St. Anne's, and he too is a prominent figure, a former judge who entered politics late, and Dorothy is uh, about as prestigious as you can get within the Anglo-Celtic community that I've been describing. There are a bunch of others, but I want, of course, to focus on Harry Truman, because Montreal was and is a hockey city. And Harry Truman 
had made himself famous, not only in Montreal, but throughout Canada, for leading the Montreal Shamrocks to two Stanley Cups, which is one of the greatest things that can happen in Montreal, and someday maybe even in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the truth is that Harry is more interesting than that as a hockey player. You check his, his uh, biography in the, in the Hockey Hall of Fame, you'll see that he's create, credited with uh, the development of the forward pass. Before the 1899-1900 Shamrocks teams, uh, uh, players were, for the most part, firing the puck to the far end, chasing after it, and working there. And Trude, whose nickname was Flip, was um, one of the ones, the one, according to the Hall of Fame, who moved the puck up the ice with short passing to his roommates. And as captain of the Shamrocks, he was a uh, great star. Unfortunately, he was injured in the 1901 hockey season. His career <coughs> was over. So in 1913, he's become a respectable lawyer and indeed a king's counsel and a leading lay figure in the Irish community. So um, we are um, involved in a, in a community which is not um, at the bottom of any one of social ladders or totem poles, but a community that's undergoing fairly constant change and has in its own mind, at any rate, a close connection with Ireland and certainly a close connection with the idea of home rule. Now, before we go any further, I have to remind you of the nature of Ireland, and I'm sure you all know this, at least contemporaneously. The six northern counties of Ireland, what we call Ulster, were, in 1913-14, as today, determined to maintain their connection with Great Britain even with the moderate nature of the Home Rule Bill. They wanted out of Home Rule and had nothing to do with the idea of being part of Ireland under Home Rule. They had therefore, in, in uh, the year before, in, in 1913, um, come together as a community and signed what was called the Ulster Covenant. And the Ulster Covenant, of which only about 400,000 people affixed their signatures, was a promise to resist Home Rule, and the phrase in the Covenant is, by any means necessary. Well, all of that could be regarded as hot air, except what we're dealing with is the formation, first of all, in Ireland, uh, sorry, in Ulster, and then secondly, in Southern Ireland, of volunteer forces training militarily. And perhaps the most dramatic thing about the difference between the St. Patrick's Day celebration in Montreal in March 17, 18, 19, and what happens next is on the 20th of March, 1914, the British Army in Ireland seems to go undergo what uh, many people at the time called a mutiny. And the headlines here are good enough to keep me short and let me move on. Astounding action by officers in Ireland. 100 resignations of officers. Activity in conference with the king and activity in Darien Street. Is it a mutiny of officers? Well, yes, it was. It was a mutiny of officers in the sense that the British government, the Asquith government, had made the decision to move military forces into Northern Ireland in order to quell <coughs> the activity of the Ulster Volunteers. They were maybe just as a show of force. And the British Army's base at Carrig in, in, uh, in, Carrig in, uh, in Ireland was where the revolt or the incident, whatever you want to call it, occurred. The Carrig conspiracy and the general who was to lead the uh, resigning uh, officers uh, was uh, uh, determined, it apparently was the case, to not follow orders uh, issued to him to take the army uh, north and to take no part of it. So, what happens as a consequence of that, again, to move quickly forward, is that both the Ulster volunteers and the Irish Republican volunteers in the south try and bring arms in from the continent. 
in the case of most volunteers successfully in a massive arms shipment. In the case of the Irish volunteers in, in Dublin, it turns into a minor catastrophe, the loss of life and the clash between the British Army and the largely unarmed volunteers. So what we see in Montreal, most newspapers, what we see in Ireland all through the summer of 1914, when we ought to be thinking about the possibility of war, except no one thought war was coming in Europe in 1914. That's really important in the sense that this point I'm making about retrospective history, the war people were worrying about was a civil war in Ireland in the summer of 1914. And um, the answer the British government has to that is that they will exclude the six counties, the Ulster counties, from the EU government for a temporary period, which satisfies no one, but which temporarily calms things down. And then the Archduke was assassinated in Sarajevo, and the days towards war come out of this basically clear blue sky. In Montreal, as in the rest of Canada, the war was greeted by a sense of excitement, of adventure, of resolution, of determination to participate as soon as possible. <clears throat> In Montreal, the various regiments, particularly the Highland Regiment and the um, uh, Grenadier Guards, uh, all parade up and down the streets of the city, but so do the French-Canadian regiments. There's a real sense that we're on the eve of momentous events, but we don't know what those events are in any realistic way. Uh, but the, the, the excitement and the support for the war across the various communities is, um, is, is evident. There's no question about it uh, whatsoever. Um, what we're dealing with, though, is a similar situation in Southern Ireland or in Ireland. Uh, outside of the Ulster counties as well as within the Ulster counties. This is a cartoon poster of John Redmond, the leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party. And I've got to be careful because this is a complex story, but I think the first thing to say is that he believed, as everybody at the time believed, the war would be short, it would either be over by Christmas or perhaps by the spring of 1915. That was the perception as everyone was basing their perception on the past, and for them the past was the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, which had been fought by professional armies on the battlefield, and had been determined by the defeat of those professional armies, or in the case of, um, of France. So the assumption about a short war, and the assumption about the way to heal Ireland, leads John Redmond to say, we, the Southern Irish will fight alongside the Ulster Division and the Ulster Protestants, and we will forge a new bond that will allow Ireland to go forward into Home Rule in the 90s. This view is uh, widely accepted in Canada and uh, is not difficult to understand, except for kind of a little you know, problem in parentheses in a moment. Um, I want to say this, and I'll try not to get into it too far. Um, Redmond is in London because he's a member of Parliament. He is not merely a member of Parliament, but closely associated with the legislation of the Ascot government. And what he has does is meets with Cardinal Mercier. Now, I assume not everyone in the room knows very much about Cardinal Mercier because people have learned very little about the history of the First World War. Mercier is the primate of Belgium. And he was, in fact, out of the country when Belgium was invaded because of the death of the Pope and the election of Benedict XV in Rome. So he returns to Belgium, and I'll go back to Belgium immediately, uh, through London. And John Redmond and Mercier make this get, speech together in front of essentially the Irish and Catholic community of London, pledging support to the phrase that will appear and appear and appear again and again, small nations must be free. We are fighting for the rights of small nations. 
and Mercier and, um, and um, Redmond are uh, together in the view that the war, which they want also relatively short, has real purpose and real meaning. That's what it's about, not some kind of abstract clash of imperialism. So um, we are back in Canada, moving back and forth a little bit. It's a picture of Herbert Brown Ames, a Tory politician, not a member of the cabinet, who was the cabinet, but an important figure in Montreal and in the uh, Bourbon government, and above all, the creator of the Canadian Patriotic Fund. And the Patriotic Fund, which my friend, the late Desmond Morton, has written a very good book about, has um, established itself to provide support for the families of soldiers who volunteer to serve overseas. Because the pay of an ordinary soldier will, of course, uh, not go very far if you support a family left behind. Now, I'm not getting into a critique of the Patriotic Fund, which I could easily, but not done. I simply say that Ames is a, is a, is a prominent figure in very much a part of the process of recruiting and of providing what we'll call public ownership in Montreal. The Ames phrase is the one that I want to stick in your mind. He says in one of his speeches, we Canadians take too much credit upon ourselves because what we really have is a British army raised in Canada fighting under the name of the Canadians. And I think all of us have to understand that the first Canadian infantry division that went overseas, and which we fought at Second Eat, and which we'll be talking about in a moment, was 77% British owned. And within the, the balance are actually quite a wide variety. Canadians, Americans, remarkably for American Americans, and Canadians largely of close British ancestry. So the phrase, a British army raised in Canada, was reinforced by the fact that the London Times and other British newspapers carried stories about the mothers in England who didn't expect to see their sons who emigrated to Canada in the five years before the outbreak of war didn't expect to see their sons for years, and here they were in a Canadian uniform. So um, we have a situation where there was enthusiasm in Montreal, there was enlistment in Montreal, what we call enlistment in Montreal, but it was overwhelmingly the very among a very small percentage of the population. I thought this might be unique to Montreal because of its magnetism as a city for young single men in the conditions of the Depression. But uh, Matt Baker, who's the boss at the Laurier Center uh, now, uh, did his MA thesis on Chatham, Ontario, and discovered that two thirds of all of the recruits from Chatham, Ontario, came from British Poland, which constituted less than 15% of the Chatham in the county population. So, we, you know, with more work on this particular subject, we might find First Division to be a quite remarkably British formation, officered, it is true, by Canadians. There was never any shortage of officers in the militia regiments who wanted to be lieutenant colonels and captains of the Never any shortage. In fact, in England in 1915, there were hundreds and hundreds of Canadian officers in no jobs looking for some kind of work because there weren't enough positions. Coaching. So we are um, the British Army raised in Canada, however, under Canadian officers, is part of the story. Another part is the Irish in Montreal. The Irish in Montreal find themselves in a situation where there's a Scottish regiment, what we call the Black Watch, two English speaking British. Protestant regiments, the Grenadier Guards and the Victorian Rifles, and no representation of the Irish, no representation of the Welsh either, who play more of the time, but they don't get there. The Irish do, but the 55th 
Irish Canadian Rangers, established in 1915, technically 1914, which is the turn of the year, are a militia regiment, not an infantry battalion to go overseas. And that's quite important because it represents a balanced judgment of just how easy or hard it would be to raise an Irish battalion on the population of the city. We'll come back to that too. So the 55th Regiment, Irish Canadian Rangers, was established and attracts a number of people. Um, and uh, it still is a situation that uh, has little to do with the army overseas. So both the 1st Division, which is 77% um, English-speaking, English-born, pardon me, and the 2nd Division, which is about 68% British-born, and is recruited in the fall of 1914, um, through to you know, maybe beyond that in the very early 1915, are still in effect the British Army was in Canada, which are overseas. Well, regardless, as we know, the Canadians, you know, just like other people, very quickly adapt to the view that it is their army. And when the first division which is judged to be well-trained and able to take its place in the line, is sent to France in February of 1915, we find ourselves with an army, with the beginnings of an army in the field, uh, which, uh, can you call it totally untrained? No. One of my students, Andrew I Rachi, wrote a book called uh, uh, Shoestring Soldiers, which tries to demonstrate that first division undergone some training in England. But it rained almost every day during the time they spent at the camps in England. And they never had an opportunity to practice at what we would call brigade, never mind divisional level. Uh, let's say they were willing and had a number of NCOs who were experienced, but nothing much beyond that. So the, se the sense that they're being sent into the line without very much in the way of training, um, is typical of the way in which things are evolving at this stage of the war. They are then, after a bit of experience in the line, experience meaning being shelled in the trenches. No operations undertaken, but simply enduring shelling. Uh, they are then sent into the East Salient. Now again, I'm very quick about this. In 1914, when the German army was advancing in what looked like a victory that would end the war, uh, the 90% uh, of Belgium was under German occupation. The only town of any real size that was still held by the Allies was Ypres. And as we know, in the Battle of First Ypres, uh, it was possible for the British to hold on to Ypres and several of the hills on the outside of the town. We're um, in a situation in uh, the spring of 1915, April of 1915, where the French army is going to undertake a massive offensive. And with demands that the British were not large enough or well enough trained, do something to assist them. And therefore, the British decide to put three of their least experienced divisions, including 1st Canadian, into the East Salient to allow the French to move troops out for their major offensive. So the Canadians, to say an experience is an understatement, move into a section of the East Salient, and the 3rd Canadian Brigade, which includes the two Montreal regiments, the Royal Scots, Black Watch, if you will, and the Royal Montreal Regiment, are on the left-hand side of 3rd Brigade, and next door to them is a French Algerian division. And the English Canadian, the Canadians from Montreal are placed in their place because there's enough bilingual people in it that the possibility of some kind of communication with the officers of the 45th Algerian Division can take place. And that coordination is quite good. And we're in a situation very quickly where uh, we are able to cooperate. But what we are dealing with, and I'm sure you all know, is that a German chemist, Fritz Haber, who later won the Nobel Prize for chemistry, not for peace, 
decides that the best way of ending the stalemate that has developed on the Western Front is to use chlorine gas to break through the defenses. Now, Haberer convinces the army that chlorine gas cylinders from the German chemical industry, if placed in a situation where there's a favorable wind, will blow clouds of gas directly at the enemy and will lead to a choking sensation, eye irritation, and nobody can stand it without protection. So the troops are bound to flee, Haberer argues. German army is, in fact, uh, very uncomfortable with this, um, as well they might be. Haberer says to his friends, he believes in shortening the war and cutting down on the casualties. He, of course, instead is opening Pandora's box. For the rest of the war, chemical warfare, with increasingly severe death-causing gases, will be a key feature of life on the Western Front. So we are uh, in the midst in April of 1915. Uh, we're in the midst of a uh, experiment by a German scientist and by the German army to see what happens. Now, the Yves Salient is a salient in B, it like that, and Haberer and his men point out that the prevailing winds in the area are from the west, and that's the last thing you want to do because you're on the eastern and, eastern and northern side of the salient. So you have to wait until you have a favorable wind. The most likely place to get a favorable wind at that time of year is from the north, and therefore the chlorine gas tubes are placed on the northern edge of the salient side of the sun, and therefore not directly at the Canadians, but directly at the 45th Algerian Division. And when the gas is released, the Algerian Division breaks, as everybody assumed it would, and retreats, exposing the entire left flank of the Canadians who are on the other side of the main road. Under those circumstances, with a wide open left flank, all that men can do is attempt to sort of turn themselves to protect the left flank. This is a picture of a trench in 1915, and the man is Guy Drummond, the son of one of the most wealthy and prominent Montreal families, the Drummonds, uh, who include the president of the Bank of Montreal. Um, and Guy Drummond, like a lot of other young Canadians, no military experience, but the right, if you will, sense of himself to become an officer is by now a captain in the uh, uh, Black Watch. And he uh, is fluently bilingual, and very much a part of the French community as well as the English community in Montreal. And um, he is one of those who are in close contact with the French Algerian division. Again, cutting through this because second week is not my topic tonight, the, uh, the struggle to hold this open left flank uh, is devastates the Black Watch. Drummond is killed, his friends are killed, others are captured or wounded or taken away as gas casualties. Um, and the open left flank can only be sealed by uh, the actions of additional units which are brought forward quickly. Um, those of you who have been to the Ypsilanti will know that the statue of the bleeding soldier, the most second most famous Canadian First World War Memorial, is uh, at Vancouver Corner. And that's because the British Columbia Regiment was brought over from deeper in the Salient to, to hold off the Germans uh, from penetrating all the way into the Salient and surrounding the London troops. So we have a a terrible battle which produces over 6,000 Canadian casualties. 6,000 casualties in the first Canadian division of 18,000 or in three. And the fatality rate is, of course, very high. Um, I'll come to this in a moment if we're not quite done. We're in a situation where this is, of course, John McCrae and the designer of steel. John McCrae is the medical officer with the artillery uh, and on the side of the canal uh, that is still in our hands attempting to create a first aid station 
in the midst of all this chaos of troops coming back to the Irish community. Uh, and um, as we all know, his best friend was killed, and that he was in a very somber mood when he heard from the Irish troops about the war. And when you read the whole text of it, you realize that it's written in the context of a serious tragedy that seems beyond human comprehension with this ghastly news and its effects upon people who are so fearful and so serious. So back in Montreal, the news of the, uh, of the devastating casualties, especially to the two Montreal regiments, the 13th and 14th Battalion, is, this is uh, nothing wrong with this, this is human nature. There are famous people, and that's what people focus on. Everybody knows Guy Drummond. Everybody knows other names, which I won't bother going into, from prominent Montreal families who have served with the British regiments. And some of the things which are said of Montreal having lost its brightest stars and the leaders of a generation dying in this terrible calamity are, uh, are, are very much a part of the newspapers and a part of the common discussion in the city. And the city is really, if you like, from this memorial services taking place in the churches, all that kind of thing happening on an almost daily basis. When news reaches the city of the sinking of the Lusitania, now, to make the story of the Lusitania very complicated and very simple, suffice it to say that a German U-boat fired a single torpedo at the largest ocean liner in the world, sailing off the coast of Europe, of, of Ireland, uh, heading towards its port. And um, as far as we can tell, and it's very controversial, but probably this is the right answer, the Lusitania, like other ocean liners, had been getting smaller and smaller passenger lists, and therefore lots of the, of the holds were empty. And the general belief is that single torpedo was able to sink the Lusitania because coal gas had accumulated in parts of the hold where there was no nobody going into on any kind of regular basis. At any rate, the single torpedo was enough to explode a ship which was thought to be unsinkable by the Titanic. And uh, <clears throat> instead it went down. And uh, during the course of the sinking off the coast of Ireland, 1,153 passengers and crew drowned. In many cases drowned in the the sucking and sinking of the ship, which drew them under even after they made it into lifeboats. Once again, um, we can uh, come at this from any number of directions, and I'm going to stick with my Montreal direction for the moment. A number of very prominent Montreal families are killed or are lost or drowned or suffered during the course of the, uh, of the sinking of the Lusitania. I'll just read you a very short passage from um, Montreal at War. And I won't we'll summarize it because I can't find it for the moment. Um, perhaps the most dramatic story is that the, the daughters of Sir Hugh Allen, the granddaughter of Sir Hugh Allen, one of the prominent businessmen who established the Allen Ship Lines, one of the keys to Montreal's maritime role, uh, were drowned along with their infant children. And other examples, including a couple of sisters who were traveling to England, I think with their sister who had been widowed at Second Luke. All of this, you know what newspapers are like, all of this was a great story. One of the other great stories that everybody talked about for days was that um, Sir Herbert Holt, another one of the magnets of Montreal uh, businessmen, owned electricity and other stuff, uh, was sending his son Robert to England to go back to uh, private school. And uh, Robert was 15 years old. The story in the newspapers, and it probably was true, but it doesn't really matter because I'm after perception at the moment, is that Robert was an athlete. 
athletic young man and a good swimmer, and he gave his life jacket for someone who did not have a life jacket and swam towards the shore of Ireland, swimming for over an hour in the sea before he was rescued. And the newspapers told the story of Robert Fulton again and again and again, along with that of the uh, Allen family and other people among the elderly, so that we had a, a tragedy that seemed to dominate the uh, lives of people in the city to a lesser degree in other parts of Canada, uh, in Lusitania also, I got some of this from the crowds, but not particularly using Montreal as my example. The consequence of these two things, followed immediately afterwards by another terrible battle, inflicting more than another thousand casualties on the first Canadian division, leads to a situation where we transform Canada's, or Britain's, Canada's British Army, put it simple, into a surge of Canadian enlistment. It seems that it's got to be more than a coincidence that enlistment through the winter of 1914-15 was the minimum, and then in the immediate aftermath of Second Heat and the Lusitania in Montreal as elsewhere in Canada, voluntary enlistment doubles and then doubles and then doubles again all through the second half of 1915 into the first four months of 1916, voluntary enlistment that includes the Irish Canadian Rangers. Now, the Irish Canadian Rangers are in a tough situation. I think that would be clear from the beginning. What we mean by that is that enlisting an Irish battalion, and by Irish we now mean a battalion which is going to um, unite Protestants and Catholics. It's to be Irish and is to finally bring about a situation of healing, if you will, between the Irish community, much as John Redmond had talked about the Irish in the battlefields of, the, uh, of, the, of France. So what we're trying to do then is not only create a, a Protestant and Catholic division uh, or battalion, I mean, but um, we're trying to do it with the fittest thing possible. That is, we want it to look like a, a, a battalion of uh, an, an ideal, if you will, Irish, something of which you can bring more freely. So that the campaign that is undertaken in 1915, late 1915 and early 1916, is one of the best funded, best organized, full of rallies, full of public support that one can imagine. And yet we are in a situation where it works at first. We are able quickly to establish a core of the battalion, about 500 men by the time of East Horizon. But we now face a situation where the Irish battalion, the Irish Canadian Rangers are waiting to complete their enrollment Battalion that's roughly a thousand men. Many of them go overseas only after they've reached 1200. So they have a long way to go. And they begin their most intense campaign in the context of the Eastern Rising in Dublin. And as many other people have pointed out, the Easter Rising in Dublin and the opening of the public campaign for the uh, uh, Irish Canadian Rangers are on the same weekend. Now, again, you may not be at all familiar with the uh, Irish uprising of Easter 1914, so I want to just give you a few things to hold on to. It lasted six days from the 24th of April to the 29th. It included a, um, a series of Men who will become classic Irish marchers. On the left is Patrick or Patrick Pierce. In 1913-14, Pierce was teaching Irish at a school and a member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, IRB, a fierce Irish nationalist determined to overthrow any kind of British connection, but a man of not only no military but of no strategic or other 
value or experience. So co sharp contrast to James Connolly. Connolly is a socialist, a Marxist, a labor leader, a syndicalist, who has led all through 1913 a strike of Dublin workers against essentially the Irish Catholic bourgeoisie, who are the leaders of the employer's side in the dispute of 1913. People fear Connolly in a way that you couldn't possibly fear Henry Pierce. And Connolly has created shock troops. Apparently, there are only 200 of them, but they were well trained, well equipped, and ready to take on British rule. Full point alert, not only with Pierce's rhetoric, but with uh, action. And as many people have said, it was Connolly who was the heart of the uprising. There are others. <clears throat> Needless to say, the story of women involved in the uh, Easter uprising and indeed in the Irish Republican cause has been largely ignored. It's very hard to ignore Constance Arkabas. Um, she is an Irish girl, despite her last name, who marries a Polish count. So I'm calling it. It's not clear whether he's a count or thought he was. Doesn't greatly matter. She is a dynamic person who um, this particular picture shows her in a uniform she created before the Easter uprising. She had a whole series of photographs taken of herself to try and, I suppose, promote the idea of women's participation in the Irish Republican movement. At any rate, she fights along with about um, 70 other Irish women uh, during the six days of the, uh, of the uprising. And um, what, the, what they do is seize the post office in the center of Dublin, digging it in St. Stephen's Green, where it really took a minute to go, and in a series of other buildings, and sort of wait till the British do something about it. Well, the British have not hesitated to do something about it, and the next days, during the six days, the casualties will include um, 66 of the rebels, or whatever you wish to call them, the martyrs killed, and 16 who will be executed afterwards. That's the total losses on the Republican side. But on the British side, 143 soldiers are killed, almost all Irish, certainly in the Irish army. And 397 are wounded. The civilian casualties are, of course, much higher, caught in the crossfire. 266 Dubliners are killed in the rising, and 2,400 wounded during the course of actions. Much of the center of Dublin is destroyed, partly because the British bring a gunship up the Liffey and shell the rebel positions. And as usual, the shelling was only intended to be active. Roger Casement is, of course, a completely different problem. Casement is world famous in 1914 as the man who had uncovered the brutality of the Belgian Congo and forced the Belgian government to take over control of the Congo, which had been King Leopold's personal domain. He had then done a similar study of the condition of Indians in the rubber trade, Aborigines in the rubber trade in Peru, uh, and um, had been rewarded with a knighthood. But Casement was an Irishman, an Irish Protestant, as so many of the extreme nationalists were. Uh, and Casement, by 1913, was arguing publicly that Germany is Ireland's opportunity, and that Germany will come to the aid of Ireland in the event of a war. So much so that after a fundraising campaign in the United States, Casement goes to Germany, by and more right and tries to persuade Irish prisoners of war, captured in 1914-15, to join an Irish brigade which will fight the British in Ireland and will be transported to Ireland by the Germans. Now, the Germans are not impressed with Casement and not impressed with the idea, but it's too good an opportunity to let slip. And so we have very quickly a situation where Casement is prepared to find ways of delivering arms to the report. Casement doesn't get to participate in the uh, uprising. In fact, 
as in the lands of a German U-boat on the Irish coast, and British intelligence as Lorne and his women were found and was arrested. What matters is that Eastman is the famous person in his international of the United States. So we have a situation where the rebellion, or Easter uprising, whatever we should call it, has happened. The Irish parliamentary party in Canada, the Irish supporters of the parliamentary party in Canada, all support the British intervention and criticize the uprising for its absurdity, its unnecessary loss of life. And Redmond, in fact, argues you must support the authorities. You can't let Ireland descend into this kind of chaos that he sees before him. So we have a situation uh, where uh, this is uh, a very, very Well, in Canada, the vast majority of the Irish population, so long as we can judge it, uh, supports Redmond, the British government, and the idea that the uprising was this mistake, terribly costly, vicious mistake. The French Canadian press is very different, particularly the nationalist press. This cartoon was irresistible because it shows Johnny Baptiste contemplating whether there is a connection between the British decision to hang Casey for treason, or his collusion with the Germans, that there is a rival in the UFO, and for his work with the trying to establish an Irish brigade, and the execution of William Rennell by the McDonald government back in the 1880s. And what one can do with it, I don't know, but it is fair to say that. For French Canadians and for some Irish Canadians, how many of us are particularly Canadian, there is a real sense that something has happened in Ireland that will begin to change things. And we begin for the first time uh, to get a reaction which is different than simply simple support for the Irish, for the Irish parliamentary party. Uh, I'm going to cut this a little bit quicker. Uh, let's say the, uh, the Globe and Mail, it was the Globe and Mail, not the Globe and Mail, had an uh, editorial writer, Lindsay Clopper, who uh, was from Ireland but living in Canada, and he too uh, particularly concerned himself with the uh, execution of Casey and argued for, uh, for clemency. Now, back in Canada, the Irish Canadian Rangers were in a situation where they now have to try and find the next five to six hundred soldiers where they are at their lot of gates in the day university uh, coming down on the street. That's the cover photograph of uh, my book in Canada at War. And um, they are, as the French be a fine looking bunch of men, uh, to keep things again fairly simple, trying to raise a, uh, another five hundred men after the Easter Rebellion coincides with a decline in the Canadian voluntary recruiting all across the country. It had nothing peculiar to do with Ireland, nothing peculiar to do with Montreal. The peak month for uh, recruiting is May, and from May on, June, July, August, through the rest of 1916, before, even before the casualties from the sun, are not aware. The decline is, is catastrophic. And this, of course, is what led to the Gordon's decision to introduce conscription. So the RCR have a, a really tough road to hang. Um, by November, despite that, they have 860 men on their road. Okay? Still got a real battalion, but much better than many of the other battalions which are being sent overseas as France. Um, one of the very good examples is that the Grenadier Guards had tried to establish a, an additional second battalion, and in a very quick quote, quote their history said that um, we were actually able to identify 5,000 
if an able man during the summer of 1916 and contacted 1,200 who agreed to undertake a medical examination. Of those 1,200, 490 were taken on strength of the battalion, but by the time it sailed, there were only 245 left. So I wanted to say that because the Irish find themselves in an increasingly difficult situation. I'll spell it out quickly. When an inspection of the battalion before it was to go overseas was called in November of 1916, there were supposed to be 860 men on the roads. On the day General Massard arrived to inspect the battalion, 300 men were away, unaccounted for, of whom 66 were officially absent without leave, which means a very large proportion of the other 200 were really forgiven in the hope that they'd come back before they were declared to be AWL. The inspection was uh, also extremely harsh on the ICO, on the Irish Canadian Corps. Even though the Irish had rejected one of these two applicants as being unfit medically or too small or taking visual problems of such seriousness, they couldn't be accepted. Of the men who were inspected and the officers, um, there were still serious problems. We'll deal with the officers quickly. Lieutenant Colonel Trehay, Flip Trehay, the hockey player, who had become the leader and the Lieutenant Colonel commanding both the 55th and the 199th, was judged to be, quote, an officer with little or no military experience and unfitted for command under any circumstances. The men themselves were healthy and fit, but were only fit for drafts as they had not come forward, even the most elementary training. So we have a situation where this extraordinary effort that was undertaken in 1916 to police battalions, not only the case of the Irish, but the case of the Grenadier Guards, has produced a situation where all that happens is we're sending over to France, or the Union initially, battalions so called, which are of varying strengths. As soon as they arrive again, they are broken up, sent to a reserve training area where they will be fed into the existing battalions in the line as reinforcements. So, in a sense, the Irish Canadian Ranger experiment tells us something about Ireland, about Canada, about the nature of recruiting. But things get more complicated when uh, Mr. Yeah. 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 For the Irish Canadian Rangers to go on a tour of Ireland. That's a quite transparent from Bruno Law's point of view, Irish, a British propaganda effort to show Ireland what Protestants and Catholics working together in a battalion can accomplish and how the Irish overseas, oh, you, you can imagine the, uh, what was running through Bruno Law's mind. The British uh, military is not keen and it first proves impossible to organize it. But in Montreal and Ottawa, Trier and Lorraine, then two, are determined to bring this about. And finally, the British government proves that in January 1917, the Irish Canadian Rangers will arrive not in England, but in Ireland, and will tour right through the country from Cork to Belfast. And of course, we'll spend time in Dublin and in other centers in Ireland, just showing themselves as Irish Canadians, Protestant and Catholic. Turns out, by the way, that less than 50% of the Irish Canadian Rangers are Catholic, and that less than 70% are Irish by any conviction in the other words, They're simply 
And I say in the book, Irish is America, it's not the world of vision. But even that isn't true. We're taking whoever we can find in the desperate race to get the things on the screen. Anyway, the tour of Ireland is an incredible success in the sense that wherever they go, they are presented. Uh, crowds appear on the streets. Dublin is, is agog with the arrival of them. And you can see pictures of the crowds lining the streets. I use a photograph of the uh, uh, it was 30 seconds to end. When Irish went overseas, not until December of 1916, as the Duchess of Connaught's own Irish Canadian Queen. Controversy about how they got that title, but the Duchess, who was the wife of the Governor General of Canada, who want them to have it. Where the treaty and the Oregon broke the wall of patronage in order to improve their chances of staying together as an Italian. You'll never know. But I wanted to stick this photograph in, and I thought I'd be a little quicker tonight, because Princess Louise is also Princess Mary, no, Duchess Louise. The Duchess is also Princess Mary Louise of Prussia. And before she marries the Duke of Connaught, Who's the fifth son of Queen Victoria? She is, in fact, among other things, the honorary colonel of one of the regiments fighting the Canadians in France. And so she's actually the honorary colonel of both the Irish Canadian Rangers and the Prussian Regiment. Okay, here is um, Colonel O'Donnell. Archbishop Logan, the Friday the Firearm here. Uh, and this is uh, with him. Um, when, when the Irish Canadian Rangers reach Ireland, Trinidad is told, the Clinton, our health club in Clinton is told, that there's no way the Irish Canadian Rangers can stay together as a battalion and go into the line as a battalion. They don't have trained officers, they don't have enough trained men, they don't have enough men, period. In fact, there's only 700 of them by the time they reach Ireland. Trihay resigns, obviously going down to resign, and uh, it looks like the tour will be in trouble. But um, you know, the, the, the Indian Army finds a, a DSO, Prince of O'Donoghue, who's an Irish Canadian Queen Colonel, to take command. And uh, O'Donoghue is a, is a well known, well established, very brave. Soldier who takes no crap from anyone. And he is given the job of leading the Irish Canadian Rangers through Ireland. And uh, he is also given the job of helping to persuade the British government and the Canadian government to keep the Irish Canadian Rangers together despite all of their deficiencies. This is a pure political plan in both Britain and in Ottawa. And it leads to them being appointed to the fifth Canadian division, which is England, and which has not yet been disbanded. I won't take you there, except to say that the success of the Irish Canadian Rangers consists of their tour of Ireland. Trihay returns, and I'm on the uh, postscript, so I'm done. Trihay returns from uh, overseas foray in New York, as many of the people did. And gives an uh, interview to the New York Post, which is later printed in all the Canadian newspapers. And it goes on at some length, and I won't read it to you. Read it all, read it yourself. But the Irish Canadian realizes that the whole we heard of the Constitution, that Ireland is under Marshall law, and it's occupied by an English army. He reads in the press that English soldiers are invented in cork and rifle and machine guns. The Irish Canadian believes Ireland will be a nation worthy of freedom. He wonders if the conscription of 100,000 Canadians would still be necessary if the 150,000 men comprising the English army are in our central front in France. He wonders. Where Canadians can best gain its own war purpose, 
vital to Canada, small nations must be free. If conscription becomes law, of course, Irish Canadians will loyally observe the law and they are Canadians. I think that that represents for Trinity the best that he can do under the circumstances, a nearly wholesome presence. It's only the majority, his friend and fellow Irish Montrealer, is the Minister of Justice that prevents action from taking against Trinidad for a speech that clearly is being interpreted as opposing the policy of the government. So we have a, um, a situation where English-speaking Canadians who are dealing with the issue of conscription, including Irish Canadians, are warned about the complexity of the situation, but there's a lot they can do. A very quick postscript on Ireland. Um, the fifth division, of course, will be used for reinforcements in 1918. And that's what will happen to the Irish Canadian Commission. They will be fed into the line. Uh, and uh, sometimes Montreal will come in, and sometimes anywhere they can be found at go. But just to remind ourselves about Ireland, and then we'll let it go. In September 1916, a few months after the uprising, William Butler Yeats, the poet laureate and official of Ireland, wrote a poem called Easter 1916, which is a repeated refrain, and we'll just have it in the last verse. It says, poem says, Now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, are changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. And the terrible beauty that was born took a considerable period of time to emerge. But we are now dealing with a situation where, by the spring of 1917, after what is called the South Longfield by election, in which Michael Collins emerges as the key leader of the forces for the Republic of Ireland. The South Longford by-election elects a Sinn Féin candidate by a margin of 37 votes, indicating the decline of the Irish Parliamentary Party and the rise of Sinn Féin has begun, but has not yet taken hold. And those of you who don't know, Sinn Féin wins the 1918 election overwhelmingly. So that's how quick the change and the emergence of the terrible beauty is. Because, of course, between 1918 and 1919, you have the Anglo Irish Civil War, and you actually have the, the sorry, you have the Anglo Irish War, which ends with the treaty, I am done, which ends with the treaty of uh, December uh, uh, 1921 in which Michael Collins negotiates with the British for a Dominion status. They will call it to keep it simple. The Irish Free State, as it's called. That is then followed by the Irish Civil War, which begins in June of 1922 and continues until the summer of 1923, in which the Irish fight each other over the Dominion Status Treaty. And then we have after the death of Collins in August of 1922, the gradual creation of a stable Irish free state. But in 1932, the Irish Republicans, the hard nosed Irish Republicans, hard to imagine anybody more hard nosed than Michael Collins, but <laughs> under a devil era, take over in 1932, and then the Irish Constitution, which will become the of Ireland's life in the 1980s, but is passed in 1937. The interplay, and this is the last word I promise, but the question is the final. The interplay between Canada and Ireland almost completely collapses after the First World War. Whereas before the First World War and during the First World War, the Irish issue was front and center in so many areas of Canadian politics. 
Canadians, I think, find the Irish Civil War particularly impossible to understand or relate to. And the uh, Irish, as a connection, aren't from St. Patrick's Day, which is a good party, featured today in Montreal by Unwin Venier and other such things, uh, becomes the only connection left. It's almost as if Ireland drops off the radar of Irish life and everything. So it's a, it is a, as being said, utterly changed. Thanks very much. Thank you.